الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وهادينا وحبيب قلوبنا والشفيع نفوسنا حبيب إله العالمين ولا حبيب إلا هو وأهله الذي سمع في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأب القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذنومين المنتجبين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق ولاستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم خلق السماوات بغير عمد ترونها وألقى في الأرض رواس أن تميد بكم وبث فيها من كل دابة وأنزلنا من السماء ماء فأنبتنا فيها من كل زوج كريم هذا خلق, هذا خلق الله فأروني ماذا خلق الذين من دونه بل الظالمون في ظلال مبين عملنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى like we know created us for one primary purpose and that is that we exert ourselves in devotion to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we can actualize the true meaning of what it means to be in a state of servitude to Him. He states, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I did not create man nor jinn, except with the primary purpose of being in a state of obedience and worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man, he comes to Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, he states, Ya ibn Rasulullah, ma ma'na hadhi al-ayah? What does this verse mean? So the Imam's response was very clear. He states, khalaqtukum lil-ibadah. There is no sort of deeper meaning toward this verse other than the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you for worship. Worship, of course, has many multitude of different lenses to it. It doesn't suffice only that worship is in standing or in bowing or in prostrating or in other ritualistic acts like that of fasting during the month of Ramadan or performing Hajj or giving in charity. But every one of our acts, every one of our moments can transcend to a state whereby if we're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it can also be a manifestation of worship of Allah azza wa jal. And everything within the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also in a state of obedience and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يُسَبِّهُ لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ As God states within the Holy Quran that everything within the heavens and within the earth is in a state of the glorification of Allah. How could the bird in the sky, how could the clouds, how could the ocean, how could the trees, how could all of these creations of God be in a state of God's glorification when most of them don't have the ability to speak, when most of them they don't have the ability to communicate, to explain, to rationalize in the way that you and I do? We believe in this concept that every single one of the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within their own mold have the ability to be in a state of God's glorification. And even me, in a state of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a state where I don't believe in a God or blaspheme Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am also a testimony to the very existence of Allah azza wa jal. Which is why many scholars of Ilm al-Kalam, they make this differentiation between that which is known as obligatory submission versus that which is known as voluntary submission. Obligatory submission is the fact that I exist. My blinking of the eye is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ability for me to wake up in the morning is not without the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My awakening in the morning thus is a sign or a demonstration of my submissiveness in front of the Lord of the worlds. Whether I like it or not, I'm alive. Whether I like it or not, I have the ability to express myself. All of these day-to-day -day experiences that we go through during the course of our lives are symbols of the manifestation of a nature of submissiveness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then there is something known as voluntary submission. 
The ability that I have to choose whether or not I will worship God today or tomorrow. I'm going to go to sleep. And when I wake up in the morning, I have a choice of whether I'm going to drink a cup of water after the sun has risen or not. I'm fasting. My obligation is to abstain from that drink of water. But at the end of the day, if I took a sip of that water, no one knows. And no one truly in dunya is going to hold me accountable, at least in the physical realm. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might choose to take away some blessings from me out of my act of disobedience, but I will not be imposed a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I choose to drink a sip of water when I wake up tomorrow morning. Fair enough? I have a choice whether or not I'm going to perform Bahar prayers tomorrow afternoon. I have a choice. I could either do so or I could not do so. I have a choice to say I will perform Bahar prayers, but I won't perform wudu. It's cold outside. Making wudu makes me more cold. And I'm fasting. And I'm already uncomfortable, right? So why should I have to make wudu? I have a choice. This is known as voluntary submission. Most of the rituals, or all of the rituals that we engage in, we have a choice to either engage in them or not engage in them. You don't have to answer this question, but how many of you know people that, for instance, choose not to pray? They know that prayers is a religious duty and obligation, but they're like, no, we're good. I'm not going to pray. There are plenty of people who say, I know that fasting is a duty that I have to be engaged in, but I just can't fast. It's just too hard for me. As if it's not hard for me. Or it's not hard for you. There's a choice that someone makes and this is what is known as the voluntary submission. Someone might pose questions like why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dictates certain laws and certain rules that I have to abide by and that I have to follow? It suffices that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king of kings and the creator of the heavens and the earth. And if he obligates me toward prayers or toward fasting or toward hajj, or toward a certain amount of money contributed in charity, my job is to be in a state of submissiveness, subservitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he's the creator and I'm the creation. The important takeaway though, is that we as a human being, we have this opportunity to engage in choice and to volunteer or not with regards to how we are going to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God has given every single one of us this intellect, this ability to perceive, this ability to know, the ability to recognize that these are my duties and these are my responsibilities. Fair enough? What makes me more unique than a tree? The tree and me, by virtue of me not engaging in any of these voluntary rituals, prayers, fasting, hajj, zakat, homs, so on and so forth, me not engaging in them makes me someone who transgresses the boundary of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while the tree is doing exactly that which God has created it for. In its own submissive state, it is submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone follow what I'm saying? I could actually be worse than a tree because Allah said pray and I say no. He says fast and I said no, I'm going to drink water tomorrow morning. He says go for hajj and I'm like no, I'd rather go to Cancun. Right? We have these choices every single day that we can make or that we can engage in. My involuntary state, my mandatory submission, by virtue of my existence, I'm engaging in it. My voluntary submission, this opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me, in itself is a manifestation of God's recognition that I have the capacity to do something incredible. I'm going to put this... I'm going to open up one quick parenthesis. I don't mean to engage this into part of a longer conversation than it needs to be, but I think that this example will help elucidate the point. My older daughter, she is nine years old in the lunar calendar, which in our law, by the majority of our fuqaha, suggests that she is balagha, she's mukallafa, she has to fast during the month of Ramadan. I was telling her and she's, mashallah, doing a wonderful job. I told her that, Zainab, you know, when I was nine years old, like, I wasn't fasting like the way you are. You should be really proud of yourself. She'd ask me for $50 after I said that. <laughs> and I told her, you can have anything that you want. But she said, how come you weren't fasting when you were nine? 
I was like, cause I, cause like, it wasn't an obligation for me, you know? And she says, but that doesn't make any sense. How come is an obligation, how come it's wise for me, but not for boys? Boys mature at a later age and their age of taklif is at a later age. Good question, right? How many of you have asked this question? How many of the sisters asked this question? Probably more so than the guys, right? <laughs> Which precisely explains why, right? <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mandated it for women before men. So I told her that if I ask you to do something, a favor for me, I say, go to the room and bring me my phone. I want you to go to the kitchen and bring me a bottle of water. If I ask you that and don't ask your sister, how do you feel? She says, I'm more responsible than her. I said, why? Because I'm older than her. Okay. In addition to being older than her, you have been tasked with the responsibility because you have the capacity, to, I didn't explain it to her like in these words, but you have the capacity to understand that your responsibility is greater because of your age, because of your maturity, so on and so forth. Is that fair to say? Allah subhanahu wa our perception of acts of worship and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are through the lens of negativity. So we see it as a burden, right? We see it as a burden. But all of a sudden, if we shift the mindset and we say, wait a minute, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored the female prior to the male, has honored the woman and says that you are tasked with this responsibility that I am ordaining upon you before these terrible gender creation, whatever, right? Known as the man, right? Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored your station above theirs. Because he knows that you have a greater potential to attain and to fulfill your responsibility than otherwise. Our perception is no. Allah is giving me more duties, more responsibilities. Why? As opposed to the opposite. At a place of employment, someone gives you a greater task, meaning you're at a higher rank. Right? Is that fair to say? Over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored her, I'm telling her. He's, he cares about you that much to know that you can do this t task and fulfill this responsibility. I say this, my friends, why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it mandatory upon the believer to fast during the month of Ramadan, to pray five times throughout the course of the day, to give out all of their charitable dues and so on and so forth. We, in an act of disobedience and transgression to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, say like, I don't want this responsibility, you know? Why wouldn't you want this responsibility when it's something that God has endowed you with and has honored you with at the same time? I am worse than the rocks than the stones, than the trees, than the water that flows without any sort of rationale or intellect, if I choose to be in a state of open disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone follow kind of the example? Yes or no? So when we go toward these ayat of the Quran, this next set, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions several realities from amongst his creation, such that we reflect and we contemplate upon their physical, we should also reflect and contemplate upon their metaphysical. The metaphysical being, again, the fact that they themselves are also in a state of gratitude, in a state of submissiveness, in a state where they recite the um, uh, tasbihat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yusabbihu lillahi ma fis samawati wa ma fil ard. And for those of you who have been following, we've been taking a look at Surah Al-Luqman, which is chapter 31 of the whole Quran, and we are at verse, huh? Then we are at verse 10. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after speaking about the characteristics and the qualities of paradise, he begins by speaking about his creation, some of which in verse number 9 we took a look at, so you're not wrong. He states, خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ بِغَيْرِ أَمَدٍ تَرَوْنَهَا He begins by stating that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who has created the skies without any pillars that you see. The sky that's above us every single day. When we look up at the sky, how come the sky doesn't fall down? How come the clouds are just present in the sky and we take it for granted? <coughs> what happens if like the sun was to fall down on us tomorrow? A cloud was to fall down on us tomorrow? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that I created the heavens and the skies above you without any pillars to hold them up that you can see, meaning that perhaps there are, in the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, certain mechanisms that he has created within this universe to allow for the sky to not fall down upon us. You take it for granted, though, the human being meaning. We take it for granted. We take the sunrise for granted. We take the sunset for granted. We take 
the sunny days for granted. Only when it rains, we appreciate the sun a little bit more, huh? It's pretty not so nice weather the last couple of days. And then the last two days in specific was really nice and really beautiful and really sunny. We forgot, again, to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sun. Because tomorrow when it rains, we're going to be like, ah, I should have taken advantage of yesterday. When it rains tomorrow, the day after that, again, we don't appreciate. Or at the very least, we don't understand, again, the uniqueness of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates this as a reminder for us. I've given this example many times before, but I'll give it again uh, for, 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 for reminder and, and for benefit. A couple of years ago, there was a student here of uh, ours at NYU, and she was an international student from a country in the East. And it was winter time here, and it was freezing cold, and it was snowing, and it was muddy, and it was rainy, and it was just not nice weather. And I remember meeting, over here, meeting her here in the prayer room, and I said, how, how are you doing? Like, you know, how do you like New York? And she said, I love New York. And I was like, you love this weather, you know? And she said, um, no, I don't love the weather, but I'm able to appreciate how much I miss home that much more. She said, at home, we have the same weather every single day, right? It's hot, it's warm, it's sunny, it's humid. She said, but over here, I get to see the snow. I've never seen the snow before. I get to see rain, and I never get to like walk in rain back home. And then she said something really beautiful. She said, I've been here for this entire academic year. She was here for two semesters. And she said, I've never in my life seen like the, the changing of leaves in the fall. And she said, I appreciate like how beautiful that is. And I just love to stand outside every single day, sit in the park, and look up. And in my mind, I was like, what type of like wisdom is this like 19-year-old kid dropping on me right now, right? I came to talk to her, make small talk, to complain about how terrible the weather is, right? And she is telling me about how much she appreciates the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of these small subtleties that, again, for most of us, we take for granted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created all of this change and all of this rotation and all of this nature around us such that we are reminded of him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He states, خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ بَغَيْرَ أَمَدٍ تَرَوْنَهَا Number one, he has created the creation. He has created the heavens and the skies such that they never fall upon us. And he's raised them above us with pillars that you don't see. وَالْقَى فِي الْأَرْضِ رَوَاسَ أَن تَمِيدَ بِكُمْ وَبَثَّ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ دَابَّةِ And at the same time, he has stabilized the earth with mountains. The majesty that appears when you see a mountain. And again, in and of itself, has minerals that can be extracted from them. In the same way you see grasslands, you see mountains, you see diversity. Imagine everything looks the same. Imagine everything around you, no matter where you go in the west or in the east, looks the same. How would you be able to update your Instagram profiles? If every place across God's green earth looked exactly the same, why would you go travel to the east? Why would you travel to the west? Why would you go to the north and to the south if the weather was always the same? If the water looked the same? People love to come to New York City. They love to come to New York City because they like to see big buildings. We like to get out of New York City because we're tired of seeing big buildings. People who are in grasslands, they love to go to mountains. People who live on mountains, they love to go to... The diversity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the universe with requires also a sense of awareness and thoughtfulness and appreciation, in other words. And God has to remind us of that consistently as he does within the whole of Quran for us to reset our thinking for just a moment. The world is a lot bigger, you know. If you travel a lot, and if you don't, you should, to the best of your ability... Sometimes you're driving, you're flying, you're on a train, you're on a bus. I don't care. You look outside and you see the way that people live, you know? And you wonder, like, like how, how does this person, like, live in this, you know, farmland, right? Do they have Wi-Fi there, right? These are good questions to ask. You, you know, I don't know, a little while ago we were driving, me and my family were driving to Toronto, right? Sacred city of Toronto. Best burgers in North America. Um... <laughs> And when you're driving like past like Albany, like you're going closer to Buffalo, God knows what, I had to like get my daughter milk a couple of years ago. My, young, my younger daughter, she needed to drink milk. 
and I could not find like a rest area on whatever that road was that we were on. We took this detour and this detour and this detour. These three. Finally, we got to like a Wawa or Seven Eleven or something, and we got anyway, right? You drive by this neighborhood, and there are these massive like homes and these massive properties, right? I told my wife, I was like, hey, you want to live there, right? And she's like, we can't even freaking find milk in grocery store, <laughs> like in this location. You want to live over here? It's like, I wonder, how do people live over here? They're so distant from civilization. Finally, you cross the border, you get to Toronto, you're like, all right, right? <laughs> We're back like in a... What I'm trying to say is, my friends, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this massive universe, this... This, this, this massive nation, this, this region that we're in, if you go 100 miles north or 100 miles south, life is so different. And we should be in a state of recognizing, again, the way that people live, their ability to like, uh, experience different situations. All of this comes out of the wisdom of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He continues. He states, وَبَثَّ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ دَابَّ And he has presented on this earth, an assortment and a diversity of animals. I looked this up. It is stated that there are upwards of 30 million different species on earth. 30 million. Most of which we probably like, don't even know what they're called or didn't even know that they existed. 30 million. We think, in our arrogance, that we're the only ones here. So who cares about everyone else? Who cares about the other creation? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to remind ourselves about this importance of centering like humility in front of him every single day. How small are we in the big massive picture of this universe? How, really, how, how small and insignificant are you and I? Which is why in the hadith uh, narrated in Kitab al-Kafi from Imam Ali al-Rada alayhi salatu wasalam, he states, Takallamu fi khalqillah. He states, speak and engage and reflect upon the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way that you understand God is by recognition of his creations before anything else. We think about God, we think about all of these questions that, you know, we try to philosophize and rationalize and we get confused about that which we appreciate, that which we understand, that which, we can, that, that, that which can solidify our subservience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this worship that we talk about, is by recognizing who's, who's, who's the authority. And we are immediately humbled because we know how small that we are in the big picture of all of this. We are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a state of des desperate need at every moment during the course of our lives. At every moment. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away the smallest thing from us, I gave this example the other day, if God had increased our body temperature by half a degree, how do you feel? You feel terrible. You can't sleep, you can't eat, you can't fast. Half a degree, half a degree. And if we decreased our body temperature by half a degree, what would happen? Same thing. We would feel awful. We would feel just terrible. Okay? If your eye was hurting, the other day I had a sty in my eye. Man, I couldn't read. I'm in, my, I'm in front of my computer all day long. I can't like, like respond to my emails. And what was it? This little tiny pimple under my eyelid ruined my week. felt miserable. This a, a, a headache. It totally, totally just messes up our day. The smallest thing. We are in abject need and poverty in, of a, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are in such need. And for the majority of our days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sustains us without us giving us one sense of thought toward that which actually we are privileged with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this same Lord who sustains us and who cares for us and who sustains the birds that fly in the sky and, the, and, the, and the, um, the fish in the deepest depth of the ocean, He still is concerned with us. The same Lord, the same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, creator of the heavens and the earth, who creates 30 million different species that roam His universe, who roam His earth, let alone the universe. How many angels, how many jinn, how many other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are there that we don't have the ability and capacity to even recognizing, he also hears your da'a. He hears when you supplicate. He hears when you ask for forgiveness. He hears when you recite Quran. Our responsibility is to know that is my God and that through my submission, I can pierce through all of those things. 
I can reach that potential that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created me with the ability to attain. وَبَثَّ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ دَابَّةٍ وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءَ فَأَنبَتْنَا فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ زَوْجٍ كَرِيمٍ He continues subhanahu wa ta'ala and he states and he allows for the water to descend from the sky. He allows for it to rain. He allows for it to rain. And through the rain, there are plants and there are crops and there are produce that are born into existence. It's pretty cool if you think about it. All of this assortment and this wide array of fruits and vegetables that all are a manifestation of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the diversity of that which we have access to in itself is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's the strawberries, and then there's mangoes, and then there's bananas, and there's every single type of berry, and there's God knows what other type of fruits that are present in front of us, all which have a unique smell, and all which have a unique taste, and all which have a unique texture, and all which have a unique color. Allah didn't have to create with that sense of diversity. Imagine Allah only created strawberries. Would anyone complain? Would anyone say, why didn't Allah create the mango? You never thought about, you never seen a mango before. How do you know that Allah should have created the mango? There's probably another creation, like, right? Come up with the word, I have no idea, right? The mango berry. What the hell's a mango berry, right? But Allah should have created it. Your intellect couldn't even come up with the word in the first place. I had to use two words that already exist and put them together. You get what I'm saying? Our awareness of the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are so limited. But out of his grace, he says, I'm going to give you this wide array and this wide diversity and this wide assortment of all of these different types of fruits. Imagine there was only the strawberries. I'm going to the grocery store. What are you going to get? What else am I going to get? I'm going to get strawberries. Imagine the only type of food that we had was rice. Rice and strawberries. Right? What are you going to the grocery store? What else am I going to go to the grocery store for? Rice and strawberries. Nothing else. And we'd be making like strawberry curries, putting it over the rice, right? Out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace, his kindness. Again, if we didn't have the capacity to be exposed to all of these things, how would we know that all of these other things existed in the first place? You follow what I'm saying or no? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he states, وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءٍ فَأَنْبَتْنَا فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ ذَوْجٍ كَرِيمٍ He allows for the rain to descend from the sky, which gives life to all of the produce of this wide array of different fruits and vegetables and all of these other creations that all stem from the rain that falls from the skies. Let me just open up one quick parenthesis here. This same Lord that allows for these rains to descend from the sky, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time, He knows where every single one, because He's Al-Alim, the All-Knowledgeable, he knows where every single one of those raindrops falls. Every single one of them. He has that precision and that detail and that diligence and that knowledge to know where every single one of those raindrops fall. And which one of those raindrops is going to give rise toward the creation of a new plant, some new produce, some new fruit, vegetable, whatever it might be. This is the all-knowledgeable Lord again. And sometimes we think that Allah doesn't understand us. Allah can't hear us. No. He can hear and he can understand and he's aware. In verse number 11, he states, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Hada khalqullah. He states that this is the creation of God. This is the creation of God, so go and look at it, first off. Go and look at it. Go and appreciate it. Go and reflect on it. Go and contemplate on it. Go and see. It doesn't take that much. We don't need to, you know, read a million encyclopedias of hadith literature in order to know that our fundamental responsibility as a creation is to appreciate that which is with that that which is around us, such that we're able to recognize the power and the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَأَرُونِي مَاذَا خَلَقَ الَّذِينَ مِن دُونَهِ and go and see what the what others have created other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, what do we have the capacity to think about? Where does our curiosity take us? Think about it. In comparison to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're in a based, humbled creation. There are those who believe that 
they're greater than God, better than God, equal to God, so on and so forth. Like, realistically, what do we have the ability to do? What do we have the ability to do? We can't even, like, process our functions, our day-to-day -day functions if we have a headache, if you have a sty in your, under, under your eyelid, right? How miserable, like, are we, you know, when we go through these experiences? When our body temperature increases by a quarter of a degree, how awful we feel. That's not in a way to make us feel terrible about who we are, but it's us to, for us to remind ourselves of our nature, our base state in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we know that, and when we realize that, and when we recognize how humble we should be in front of the Lord of the worlds, we unlock everything because we know that we're a servant of God. And there is nothing more beloved than being associated and connected with the Lord of the worlds. He states, And surely those who oppress their own selves, they are in clear error. Let me conclude with this in honor of the birth of Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba, alayhi salatu wassalam, very, very quickly. Of course, Imam al Hassan alayhi salatu wassalam, has many a unique merit, but I think that that which oft gets, that oft gets forgotten when speaking about him, salamu alayhi, is just how he taught us in demonstration of what it means to be a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about worship of the Prophet, worship of Ali, worship of Imam al Hussein because of Dua Arafah, of Zayn al Abideen, we have all of these examples. But we often forget that Imam al Hassan alayhi salatu wasalam, he also teaches us again his humbled station in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a source of inspiration for our. Um, dedication and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First off, Imam al Hassan, salamu alayhi, he needs no introduction. He needs no introduction for he is the son of the daughter of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He is the eldest grandson of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. His father is Ali and his mother is Fatima, and it suffices that he needs no other introduction other than he comes from the line of purity and infallibility peace and everlasting blessings be upon him. And even in this rank, and even with this station that he has attained, salamullah alayhi, he would walk from Medina to Mecca, and he would stand in front of the Holy Kaaba, and he would recite lines like, Ilahi abduka bibabik, that, oh my Lord, your servant is at your door. They would stand next to him and they would state, you are the grandson of the messenger of God, you are the son of Fatima. Why is your face pale? Why are you trembling? before you're entering in front of the Holy Kaaba. He would respond, And why should I not be like in this state? For I am a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This dedication, this devotion that he teaches his companions, and he teaches us, is one of the manifestations that we should be reflecting upon when it comes toward the station of Imam al-Hassan, alayhi salatu wassalam. I also wanted to share one other hadith from Imam al Hassan alayhi salatu wasalam, which is one of my favorite lines, and nonetheless, it is super important during the course of these days that we're in, in which the Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, he states, Ra'sul aqal mu'ashiratun nas bil jameel. He states that the peak of intelligence is to treat people with beautiful conduct. That truly, if we are a believer, and we walk in the footsteps of the best of creation, Allah, alayhi, then our responsibility is to be the best. And it starts with how we treat other individuals. How we treat others, like we know, is a reflection of our own selves. And there's a lot of anecdotes. Many of you are familiar with the story of that man who comes to curse the Imam, who comes to kill the Imam, Allah, alayhi, from on behalf of Muawiyah and the way that the Imam responds to him. I don't want to get into this anecdote, but just really, really quickly. The Imam Salamullah Alayhi, he teaches us this lesson again. And we need to recognize and like implement this and try to utilize these nights and days during the holy month of Ramadan to supplicate to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that we're able to reach this height. Our interactions with people are a reflection of who we are internally. That's the truth. So when you see yourself getting angry and frustrated, I'm talking to myself before anyone else, with other individuals, during these nights and days during the holy month of Ramadan, that's a reflection of where our heart is at. We need help. During this month of reformation, which we seek toward purifying and cultivating our hearts, 
We need to ask and beg from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows for these hearts to be purified to the extent whereby I'm always demonstrating good etiquette with fellow like sisters and brothers in faith. Imam al-Hassan, salamullah alayhi, that which people were so brought to him and thus brought toward the message of the Prophet and of Ali and of Fatima, peace and blessings be upon them, was on the basis of how we interacted with other people. The way that we speak, the way that we engage, the way that we smile, all of these things, again, demonstrate where we are internally. We, as followers of the best of creation, Muhammad and Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein, and the children that come from their progeny, need to make sure that we take inspiration, lesson from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them, such that we're able to walk in their footsteps by emulating their characteristics and their qualities. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahumma ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala tayyibina wa asirina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.